This is The Cole Memo. I'm your host, Cole Preston. Every episode is released in audio, video, and transcript format. To find the transcript, audio, or video version of any episode, please refer to the description of the episode that you're listening to now. Within that description, you can find a link that will take you to our website, which will display the transcript for this episode and the platforms where you can find this episode in audio or video formats. If you're unable to locate the episode description on whichever platform you're listening from, Simply note the episode number and visit thecolememo.com. From there, you can find the corresponding episode, and then you'll be able to access the audio, video, and transcript version of that episode. While you're there, you might also find any links that we referenced during the episode so that you might be able to do your own research. If you're not listening to this episode of The Cole Memo on Patreon, then you're listening to this episode later than our patrons. To become a patron, go to thecolememo.com slash Patreon. It's a great way to support our show. It only costs $3 a month, and it's one of the best ways to directly support this show. Uh, Folks, this show is funded by listeners like you. One of the best ways uh, to support our show if you're not able to contribute is absolutely free. Subscribe to or follow our show. Leave us a positive review from wherever you're listening to us from. Favorite this episode, give it a thumbs up. Leave a comment or post a review. As always, your engagement and support is appreciated. Today is January 23rd, 2024. I'm sitting down with Jim. Jim, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? And uh, after that, the floor is yours. You know, let's talk. Yeah. Thank you, Cole. Uh, my name is Jim Blissett the Third. I'm nearly a lifelong resident of Chicago, the South Side to be specific. And, um, you know, as soon as 2020 hit, the law shifted in the uh, cannabis arena. You know, I saw an opportunity to take my life experiences the experiences of my father, almost what 15 year military policeman, as well as just incorporate my friends into an industry we have known, you know, almost our entire almost teenage and adulthood, you know, through consuming cannabis. And we went after the cannabis transport license. You know, from the beginning, we had the intent of pursuing this opportunity as a third party uh, transporter focused specifically on transport. You know, we saw an opportunity to really enter this space. So you know, thank you, Cole, for having me and allowing me to share my story and some of my thoughts around the industry. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I have an idea uh, that I know what you want to get into because I've asked uh, the cannabis regulation oversight officer in the past. Um, and we don't have to get into this, but I just, you know, we uh, we recently made it so that curbside was permanent. And that did not happen through a legislative effort that was codified. And curbside in and of itself was created from what I understand. It was a variance that was issued uh, during the COVID pandemic. It was not written into law and they made it so that you could get, you know, curbside delivery and they kept having to extend it. And I kept asking the question, why don't they just make it permanent? And then they did. And so my question was, if they can just do that, can they make delivery legal like home delivery and their answer was no and i'm curious um if that's what you want i'm going to give you the floor uh what would you like to talk about that's yeah awesome so i definitely want to touch on home delivery you know i know as it stands the cannabis regulation and tax act um limits transport you know to b to b you know and it's very explicitly stated within the law you know it it's it will likely take some shifts in springfield to make um, home delivery uh, more viable and an option. You know, for me, I'm most focused on, you know, we know home delivery will at some point enter Illinois. I want to make sure those of us who are already pre-existing and operating as cannabis transporters, especially those of us with social equity status, we have some privilege, you know, when it comes to this new market and industry taking off. So I'm appealing to our legislator to you know put us at the front of that line once it happens you know those of us operating as third-party transporters we are not attached to a grow we're not attached to a dispensary we are strictly third-party transporters 
And as it stands, the industry, within the industry, we're seeing what amounts to a monopolization of transport by your growers. Your large-scale multi-state operators are really dominating that B2B space. So as we move towards incorporating home delivery, you know, I'm just hoping we get some priority as third-party transporters within this process. So I know for my company, uh, McKinsey Secure Transportation, you know, when we started to draft our standard operating procedures, we had some foresight in hoping that home delivery would or will come in the future. And we wanted to position ourselves to be a, a viable player in that space. So, you know, that, that's, that's a major push for us uh, legislatively. How can we now evolve the law? You know, when we started out, we did, you know, we went to every incubator you can think of, you know, every opportunity to sit down and hear Toy Hutchison at the um, beginning of this speak. You know, Toy Hutchison, the original cannabis czar, she made it clear, like, hey, guys, we're only rolling out about her prediction, 10 percent of the industry. This is a very small fraction of what's to come. So we're going to need your help to really evolve and make sure the state is operating in the most efficient way. So here's one opportunity to push the state forward with evolving policy related to home delivery. Aside from that, you know, we, we're still pushing for docking, you know, as it stands. You know, third party transporters, we cannot hold product overnight. So there's been some uh, policies and legislation that's gone to Springfield and essentially died where we've requested a 48 hour hold where we can actually store cannabis product. This would allow for the creation of what amounts to a distribution model. And then it will also help our clients. You know, when we sit down with the MSOs trying to get contracting, they're asking us, well, can you all make the drive from, hey, say Chicago? all the way down to Southern Illinois in a way that's efficient. As it stands, you know, this is looking like a 15 hour day. And with the ability to store product, whether that be through cross docking or traditional docking, we'll be able to reach the entire state. Not only will this benefit the MSOs, it will benefit your small craft growers who are now struggling to come online with this uh, pending February deadline. You know, it's, it's difficult. We're sitting now with one client, they're trying to move product from um, Tinley Park throughout the state, but their ability to do this is limited by their capacity, funding, staff, so on and so forth. So a company like ours operating in this niche space, you know, with the ability to store product overnight, we can really, really tackle a bunch of these bottlenecks already hampering the industry here in Illinois and um, throughout the country, really. So yeah, that's, that's where we can start, Cole. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I just wrote down that. F what When is that February deadline? Do you know? Is it February 22nd? I think it's February 4th. I February think it's 4th. the fourth of February. Or it's the first week of February. Uh, craft growers, uh, by by uh, law, are to become operational. They they received an extension from last year's March date, um, but come February, uh, they should be up and running. And am I wrong in saying that? I mean, I don't mean to get too far into this, but did they like make it clear that they're not going to extend it again? I haven't seen anything about an extension. You know, I, I'm I'm really focused on transport. Sure. I much love to the growers and the uh, dispensaries. But, um, you know, as it stands, and I'm seeing a lot of movement now. There's a lot of energy around some of these smaller craft growers trying to get off uh, off the ground. We've received some really great um, communications and emails from a number of them looking for transport support. And it, that urgency for February is there. I can feel it. So, uh to take it take it back to transportation um you kind of touched it, uh, a few different bases the distribution issue and um all of the different issues that come up one of the issues that that i kind of wanted to take a step back on was like that i don't know that maybe enough people understand is that the like the position you are in as a tr a person with a transportation license um Am I wrong in saying that like most of the MSOs or licensees that were already established use their own transportation so they don't use you, right? Right. Well, yeah, they do have internal transportation. We've had really great, um, you know, essentially partnerships with some of the larger infusers um, and needing just support, extra support. So without saying one company, they're one of the largest uh, infuser processors in the country operating as a multi-state operator. They've called on us to, again, provide support. Some of these long haul runs are really um, burdensome, not only for the company, but also their staff. I mean, we come in in a specialized way and provide that support. 
Um, we see a tremendous opportunity with the craft growers, you know, if, if and when they can come on board, you know, they're operating with limited resources. So that transportation, um, you know, model becomes, like I say, really burdensome for those smaller companies looking to really move product throughout the entirety of the state. You know, when we started this out, you know, I mentioned, you know, during our planning phase, we went to every incubator. One yeah. of those incubators included um, some industries and they all out let us know like, hey, you know, we know how to grow, but we struggle at some points with transport. Although we have not gotten to an actual contract with them, you know, we operated early on knowing that some of these major companies are looking for support. Now, you know, the next step is making this manifest. You know, it's one thing to speak on it, but, you know, extending contracts and offering opportunity to those of us, that's just like the home run for us. But, um, yeah, we, we're looking to support and not necessarily to uh, dismantle. Right. Well, to your point, um, I've heard from like a new era. They're a company that were originally licensed and they have a part. They don't have a cultivation center anymore, or at least from what I understood, they are in a partnership with IESO, which is another original licensee. And they were talking about how, yeah, it, it can be hard they have to really plan their day if they're going all the way to like Chicago since they're coming from like Southern Illinois and they got to make it back in time. So, I mean, at least to your point on that, on, on that point, you're not alone and you could probably get support. Like you say, you're not trying to tear people down. You could probably get support from all of them, at least on a provision like uh, the depot or at least it's some holding type of protocol so that you're not limited to like, you know what I mean? To, to one day, cause Illinois is a big state. Um, I'm curious, what are some other issues though, that, that you face as a, uh, if you'd like to add to that point at all, you can, but I also also would like to hear, um, you know, what are other issues that you face as a trans transporter? Yeah. You know, I think, um, you know, when the DCEO social equity lending went out, you know, I think we were really uh, pushed to the back of the line with the funding. You know, we're, we're looking for an increase in DCEO social equity lending, you know, uh, opportunities for those of us operating as social equity companies. We were one of the few transporters who did pursue the initial pot of DCEO funds, and we were successful in securing funding that allowed us to, uh, you know, get a rental property, acquire three vehicles, you know, uh, bring on some limited staffing. But, you know, that 125000 we would love to see an increase in, in lending opportunities. You know, whether or not that becomes forgivable, you know, will allow, you know, the powers that be to determine that. But, you know, we would definitely call on the state to open up those streams of lending to support these transporters. And not just the transporters, but the craft growers, as, as well as the dispensaries who are looking for capital. You know, it's... um. It's pretty much known now that capital has been really hard to come by in the space um, and that, you know, Cannabis Regulation and Tax Act really push for the funding of these social equity businesses. So we want to make sure the state is standing true to what the law is calling for. Um, you know, aside from that, I know there's a big push for more uniformity between all, all of the entities uh, really regulating the space. There's been a uh, there's been a lack of regulation when it comes to transport. You know, I, I know a cluster of transporters early on put forth a lawsuit, you know, whether or not it was, um, you know, symbolic or ceremonial, I don't know. It it did bring forth the issue of individuals operating outside of what the law is requiring, right? So are your vehicles in compliance? Are we treating staff um, appropriately? Are we operating in accordance with the, the actual laws? And as it stands, there's just not enough oversight uh, from the regulation uh, of the state to really make sure folks are playing um, in accordance with the rules. So we definitely want to see that uh, regulation is really um, looked at properly. But I, I would say those areas, so that funding piece, the uh, ability to store and dock, and then that home delivery piece, I mean, it's critical. That will allow us to really become truly viable and have a, a space of our own in this industry, right? Aside from, you know, trying to partner with the growers, so on and so forth. This uh, business to consumer piece is critical as a next step for delivery and transport as a whole. Um, so, you know, we've been appealing to the, the Illinois Working Group, the Cannabis Working Group, and I've had conversations pretty much across the board. Um, I know the Independent Illinois, Illinois Transporters Association 
it's a new organization, but we've uh, been pretty successful last year in securing a moratorium on new licenses. And then we've had the ability now to abolish licensing fees for the next two years. So that gives us a little assistance, but uh, a lot more still needed. And, and again, we're approaching this from the position of partnership um, as opposed to totally dismantling the industry, at least from my perspective in our company. Sorry, I almost muted myself there. Um, I wanted to ask you about, I'm reading your press release that you sent me. Um, you were advocating for the implementation of a third-party mandate in cannabis transportation. Did we already talk about that and what that means? No, we haven't. So, you know, I, we've seen a mandate in certain states like Michigan and some others where, um, you know, if uh, MSOs are not willing to... Uh, deconstruct the monopolies we're going to ask the state to create a mechanisms uh where we can be considered for transport opportunities first you know and if this isn't viable we're asking for a percentage so we've seen um you know some individuals look at a 75 percent outsource of all transport to third-party transporters and again i see this as a bargaining chip you know if other um, options aren't suitable and viable perhaps we can seriously look at a third-party mandate where the msos are in essence now forced to do work with us if they're not willing to break up and bust up some of these monopolies. Um, because that's what we're looking at if this continues to go on as it stands. Why did the, the state or why did the Cannabis Regulation and Tax Act create a transport license and the ability to stand up a third party license if indeed the intent is for MSOs or growers to you know keep the work in house? That would contradict um, the essence and the spirit of the law. You know, and definitely stand in opposition to social equity. So we're definitely, um, you know, in support of a third party mandate as the last resort if we cannot secure viable work for social equity transporters and um, those of us of social equity status in the third party space. Yep. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. And as you were saying earlier, I, I was I feel like I just caught up with you. I've been smoking a few joints this afternoon. <laughs> um, you were saying that. I, I'm looking at your press release now, which folks all have this attached in the podcast description if you want to check it out yourself. Um, you're proposing, to restate what you said earlier, you're proposing a, an exclusive privilege for third-party cannabis transporters, uh, especially those of social equity status, to engage in home delivery if it were to become a thing. Precisely. That's, yes, sir. Gotcha. Precisely. Uh, again, you know, this will allow the license to become viable and have a true purpose, you know, rather than recreating the wheel. And, um, you know, at some point we can open this up, but as you know, at the, at the beginning of this, you know, I'm definitely pushing for an exclusive privilege, um, as it relates to third party transporters, this will allow us to become viable and have our market share within the, uh, Illinois cannabis industry. You know, of course, you know, I'm not saying this should be something that should last forever, but, you know, as we create policy around this, you know, I would ask the state legislator to really consider us in creating and erecting laws around home delivery. We're in a position as it stands with, um, you know, standard operating procedures in place. We currently have the license. Um, some of us, we have the funding and capital to really uh, make this a reality. Why not start with us? Yeah. Yeah. And back to the point you said, though, before because it's interesting you brought up market share that what you are proposing if you're saying that that what was it again that, that third party the implementation of a third party mandate in cannabis transportation it's not written in the law and i agree with your logic that it seems that if they are exclusively using in other words let's just put it shortly if they're vertically integrated yeah right Right. That would seem to be at odds with the spirit of the law. Is that a good recap of what you were saying? Exactly. exactly. Now, what, what I'm saying is I agree with your logic and everything, but it seems like this, like this law was framed around the idea that you just talked about market share. And like, I think it's important to remind people that you know, before as we were leading up to legalization, these big companies were lobbying uh, to keep like kind of the market exclusive on the on the logic that they built it, so they should have like primary access to it for I think at least a year they were asking for, and coincidentally, 
that happened and some, I mean, still you could argue they have a chokehold on it. And because of the fact that it seems that social equity is paired with the idea of market share, like I feel like, I don't know, we're just going to keep getting caught in this loop of, uh, you know, um, yeah, if we, if we, if we're if that's the goal of social equity is to preserve market share, I feel like we're just going to keep get getting caught in this like David and Goliath fight of like, hey, why can't I get in? It's not fair, you know what I mean? Yeah. So that's kind of me just thinking out loud. But go ahead. Yeah, I get that. I respect that. You know, when it comes to home delivery, you know, uh, as it stands, there is no policies around there. There's there's nothing around right. this. And, right. You know, in the same way the MSOs or the you know previous medical operators asked for that one year. <laughs> You know, we would act as transporters at least for a time frame where we can, you know, really uh, spearhead uh, policy and growth in this home delivery space. Uh, so I, I would humbly ask for the same thing the uh, MSOs and medical operators ask for, you know, at the uh, onset of this new adult use recreational, uh, you know, industry as uh, there's no policies related to home delivery currently. Yeah. And I get that. We actually had... um I totally get where you're coming from. We had J.R. Fleming on and he basically described it again. As I said, it seems like people are all pairing the idea with social equity and market share. So as he described it, just like those companies had first dibs on the market, he expects that or, or that I don't mean he, he and they, though, I'm kind of speaking on, on my experience with him and everybody else that pairs those ideas. And, and just to be clear, you know, for me, I think, um, you know, social equity is critical, but I'm an advocate for third party transporters, you know, so, right, um, right, right. you know, I, I want to make sure third party transporters w really have some priority in this space. You know, I think we've gotten the short end of the stick across the board, you know, whether it be, uh, you know, news outlets not covering us, you know, us not being considered in debates in Springfield, so on and so forth. I feel sure. like we've kind of been a stepchild. So third party uh, transport across the board you know, of course, you know, I'm an advocate for social equity uh, operators. You know, I come from that space. Right. You know, pretty much been a South Side of my whole life almost, you know, from Inglewood to Park Manor, where I chose to buy my home, you know, and stay in the community. Um, but definitely I support third party entities looking to really carve out this niche space, providing secure and professional services, you know, across the board with social equity being a bonus, you know. Right. I totally get where you're coming from. And I guess just to get to my point that I was like working up to, it's like, it, it is interesting that the, it seems like the idea of social equity is ex almost exactly the business plan of all these companies that currently have a stranglehold on the market. Explain, I'm, explain, go, go, go further. Go further. Sure. Like uh, the idea, it seems like, when so for example in the and i know that this is does not have to do with transportation so let me preface it with that but i'm just saying that like the idea of preventing dilution of the market and even like the moratorium that was just proposed which i guess is related to transportation it's the idea that it's like you know we got to stop issuing licenses because people can't even make money or whatever and it's just like it, it's to me I just don't understand that because in other industries, we don't do that. Like with restaurants, for example, I always use that example. Like nobody is advocating for license limitations or moratorium on restaurant licenses, yet 80% of restaurants go out of business within the first five years. Yeah, and I see your point. I, I would say the difference would be the level of control the state has really maintained on this industry right. and really influencing it right here at the foundation of the industry, this new space, you know, I get it. Like I let capitalism play out, but what we're right. seeing is something totally different than pure capitalism, you know, with so many hands um, in the pot at the state level, really controlling this. And I, I always want to go back to what Toy Hutchinson, you know, you know what became her mantra True. at the beginning. Hey, this is only limited rollout, you know, in effect, this is only an experiment, you know, with what she considered to be only 10% of the industry standing up, you know, um, at, this isn't pure capitalism, Cole. Not right. yet. <laughs> right. I, you know what? I used to have a quote by her that is basically exactly what you're talking about, uh, to your point. And I, I, I'm butchering it now, but 
or I would butcher it now, so I'm just going to say the short version of it. She said, we knew 95% of people that applied for licenses weren't going to get them. Yeah. It was something, I think it was something like 3,500 applications for what was going to be 75 licenses. We knew that 95% of people weren't going to get them or some number like that. I don't know. Don't quote me the number, but I can, I can try to put that link in the podcast description if folks want to see that clip. So Yeah, yeah, certainly, certainly. But, you know, with that said, I'm curious to see what steps will, you know, occur to roll out the next 90% of this industry, you know, um, whether it be, you know, new cultivators coming on board, you know, what will that process look like? Uh, that's still to be uh, determined at the state level in Springfield. You know, even with the con consumption lounges statewide, you know, we're seeing um, like, you know, Cook County having a very limited rollout. Um, you know, whereas the uh, state law, you know, does provide a privilege for the establishment of these consumption lounges. But we haven't seen that coming to manifestation yet. Right. So we're at its infancy. You know, I get it. You know, those of us, you know, who are, you know, operating from a truly capitalistic perspective, like, hey, I get it. Like, hey, right. You, right. Know, you guys can't cut it. Fold your businesses. Going, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever, <laughs> whatever. whatever. But, you know, I think the intent of the law is still on the table. And I think the uh, control Springfield has had over this industry creates a different dynamic that must be considered, you know, when comparing us to like restaurants or, yeah. you know, other industry spaces. So I get the pushback, but at the same time, like if that's the case, call for Springfield to step back. Yeah. You know, hands off. Yeah. Well said. Well, um, thank you for addressing those points. Because uh, it's something that's been rattling around in my brain and probably will continue to, but uh, I totally get where you're coming from. So, um, well, did we are is there any other ground with regard to what you would have specifically liked to have spoken about today? I know that I took us on different tangents and stuff. No, 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 no. I, I appreciate the opportunity just to have the conversation. Yeah, yeah. To bring transport, you know, to the table. You know, I recall a. Um, an article, I think in the, in the Sun Times or the Trib some time ago, where they stated that there's only 10 true third party operators in the state, you know, from it was from the transport uh, space. You know, a lot of folks pursue this transportation license in hopes of tying it to a grow or to an infuser. And when they fail to get the uh, grow or infuser license, their transport license became null and void or moot so there's a lot of people um you know with the transport license who are not using it but there's a few of us who entered this space um looking to work you know and provide that third party support from the beginning right we have a vision here and um you know we're going to stick to this you know and see it through we've been able to really cut some incredible uh, corners with um cost savings through um you know aligning with a really great landlord you know, pretty much our overhead is relatively low, um, but, you know, we still would love to infuse some more capital into our business to give us just some more um, surety. But, you know, I want to, again, you know, bring forth the reality that we've had some incredible opportunities from the MSOs, from the new uh, infusers coming on board, as well as the new craft growers who are now standing up. So, you know, I reject the uh the misconception that hey there's no work for third party transporters that's just not true you know unfortunately early on we were not in the position to handle some of the work early on but now we're ready to go and we appreciate everyone who has you know reached out to us you know looking to solidify partnerships those who have actually signed the contracts and actually given us work you know um another area i think folks should really look at you know, with that DCEO lending, you know, the role of that rollout of that lending uh, program was a hot mess. You know, the, the state uh, partnered with a number of entities and um, the program just didn't roll out in accordance with what was envisioned early on. Right. So, um, you know, us, for example, we were able to establish a relationship with, uh, you know, a great credit union. Uh, but, you know, we, we look for some uh, more more funding opportunities. And maybe even some changes in how uh, cannabis banking is occurring at the credit union level here in the state. You know, of course, you know, we're hopeful that movement happens at the federal level, but I wouldn't want anything that happens at the federal level to trump the strides we've made here locally in Illinois. Right. Um, 
So, you know, I look forward to, uh, you know, legalization nationwide, but I want to make sure Illinois is firm and solid and we have a really good grasp on what's happening here in the state, right? And if anything, you know, let the state really uh, regulate what that looks like. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot of work to do. I'm truly optimistic about this call. I never thought it would be an easy walk in the park. And, um, you know, I'm here for the struggle and the fight. You know, we, we're taking, uh, you know, my father's military experience. He left the military and went into trucking, you know, went into trucking and went and worked for the post office as a truck driver. You know, for me, that afforded me opportunities as a kid in Inglewood to go on to, you know, undergrad, college, get my master's. Now I'm working on my doctorate. But throughout all of that, I assisted my father with his trucking business. Not only my father, but like all of my cousins. And trucking in my community has been a life source for men, you know, who have looked for upward mobility. And I ask that we consider, you know, those communities who have been most affected by the war on drugs, you know, as we create policies around transport, because transport at large like I say, has been a lifeline for my community and the men within my community. So, uh, you know, I'll leave you out with that. Well, um, if you, do you have uh, time uh, just to talk about a few unrelated topics as well? Yeah, yeah sure. Sweet. Yeah. Um, I We don't have to get, like, I, I'm sure it's not a crazy interesting topic, but I am just curious. I know people, several people that have worked in the cannabis industry. And like you said, you have to bank at credit unions. I think that's just interesting. Is the difference like that you just can't do like a FDIC or like a federally insured bank? Is that is that why? Because it's like federal cash yeah. or something. Yeah. Involved? You know, exactly. You know, essentially what we're doing is illegal at the federal level. Right. right. So the FDIC banking uh, really, you know, obstructs great movement. But, you know, the credit union we're working with, they're awesome. You know, they're awesome. We just wish there was a bit more coordination between the state and that credit union. You know, there's some um, really strict guidelines on some things. Oh, like to get out. them maybe your DCEO loan. Is that what you're saying? Or Yeah, that DCEO loan rollout was a mess. You know, early on, Cole, it was a mess. You know, and it was, it, was it just because they couldn't understand how to get it to your credit union? Well, no, 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 no. Uh, you know, they, the, the lending partner looked at assets and, you know, pre-existing work in the industry. And we just didn't have that early on. And from my understanding, no one of social equity status, you know, met the requirements, you know, that were on the table early on with the uh, banking process. But I'm happy the state decided to go ahead and afford, you know, the, the lending opportunities through the state directly. Right. Which should have been at play from the beginning. You know, I, you know, it's what I think. But um, there's still a lack of coordination between the the state and, and our banking partner. You know, are you there talking was about some, what uh, happened with the omnibus bill where they like transferred money? Is that what you're well, saying? Well, I mean, no, no, no. I don't. It didn't take a bill. So what happened early oh. on when this when DCEO realized no one was receiving lending through the credit union partners, DCEO decided to lend directly. Okay, Thank third you. party, third party out of the equation. Gotcha. Um, so that afforded us the opportunity to get some banking. Yeah. Well, actually some funding. We still opted to work with that banking partner, but we were kind of locked into that banking partnership as a product of us pursuing the original lending through the third party. And at that point, we were already locked into a relationship with them. So it's like, let's just continue banking with them. Um, you know, I can't speak too much on it. There are certain NDAs in place about how much we're paying monthly. <laughs> you know, to the credit union we're working with. But we would love to see a reality where some of those fees are reduced. And, you know, I tell everyone that we're signing contracts with, whether it be growers or an infusers, hey, we're paying the same monthly fee as you all to our credit union. So we're not going to relax our prices as if this is just some run of the mill Uber pickup, you know, order or something like that. Give transporters, um, you know, our respect because our bills are the same as yours, you know, at the end of the day. Um, but, you know, again, DCEO opted to, you know, afford lending directly to licensees and removing that burden from the third party, you know, credit union partners and the credit unions failed back as just traditional, you know, bankers as opposed to lenders. Um, you know, of course, we're now in a position to, you know, appeal to our, you know, banking institution once more for some lending. You know, perhaps we'll do that. 
but we're looking to see what happens at the DCEO level as, you know, they promised another round of funding will soon open up. The question is when and what will that look like? So I know, um, you know, some of the individuals within DCEO has put us on standby. Hey, funding is pending. Hurry up and wait. So we're waiting to see what that looks like. You know, we're not going to, you know, jump off into the deep end and go after, you know, private equity at this point as we're waiting to see what happens with DCEO. If we can indeed secure some additional lending through the state at a really great interest rate, we're going to opt to go in that direction as opposed to, you know, looking into the private equity route. But um, it's to be determined. There's so much in the air, you know, with DCEO. You know, I know some opportunities, have, you know, have opened up, you know, for other businesses established during COVID. Unfortunately, those um, options do not apply to us as we are operating at what's considered federally illegal waters. So we can't pursue many of those um, opportunities within DCEO. So we're now just patiently awaiting the state and some movement related to that social equity lending and the next round of that is to be determined. Gotcha. Well, um, I wanted to wrap up the uh, show with just uh, the clip that you referenced, a small clip that you referenced about the transportation thing, just like for context for people. And then I actually wanted to play a clip that's an older clip that I'm just curious if you have, have any thoughts on. It has to do with all the regulations you have to face as a transporter, um, which they sound like crazy. Um, so, uh, but... First, I just wanted to play this short clip just so that people knew if they were wondering what we were talking about earlier. So, Well, now to a story you'll only see on CBS2. This is how you're legally supposed to transport marijuana in Illinois, in a vehicle with cameras, GPS, and no rear windows or markings. But illegal deliveries are reportedly happening by those who are not following the rules. In fact, more than a dozen licensed cannabis transporters are now suing the state of Illinois. CBS 2's Charlie DeMar is live in the control room with the story. Charlie. And Joe and Erica, those licensed transporters say those images that you just saw are evidence of illegal transports. And without regulation and enforcement from the state, they say there really is no incentive from dispensaries and growers to use those licensed transporters. This camera's mounted in inside here. Noberto Brown has poured thousands of dollars into his truck. This is to accommodate all the products that will require refrigeration. He intended to legally transport marijuana throughout the state. So we had to do all these steps and then for us to come up zero. You haven't made a delivery with this truck? haven't made one delivery at all. Brown was one of the first to get a cannabis transporter license. He custom fit his truck to follow state guidelines. There's no back windows. It's equipped with cameras, GPS, and other safety features. Wow, like we were just blown because we're doing all this stuff to become compliant. Transporter Berwyn Tompkins blown away over these pictures that he says prove marijuana transportation laws are being skirted with no consequence. Like this minivan apparently delivering cannabis and another drop off allegedly by a company without an operational license in a vehicle with rear windows. We do think it is a resource issue. Attorney Ryan Holes filed a lawsuit against the Illinois Department of Agriculture on behalf of 13 licensed transporters, accusing the state of failing to enforce its own rules surrounding cannabis transportation. You basically get the market undercut and the transporters who are compliant just really don't have any chance. We're bleeding money trying to stay afloat. I can't keep paying the licensing fee every year to, to make zero zero sales. Are you optimistic that things will change that you know that you can stay in business? I'm not optimistic at all. And those pictures you saw were entered as evidence in that lawsuit that was filed. And we asked the Department of Agriculture if they have issued any citations to transporters or for illegal transport transportation in the state at all. A spokesperson declined to comment, citing that pending litigation. We are live in the control room. I'm Charlie DeMar. So um, to back to your point, I try to give the space for transport transporters on this show and uh, just wanted to put it out there that if you're if you're a transporter or if you know any other transporters, Jim, that want to come on and have anything they want to talk about, you know, um, yeah. I know I have people from all over the industry on this show and I, I you know, would love to have more perspectives from transporters uh, before we move on to the the 
show that I think will open up some more thoughts. Did you have any thoughts on that? If not, we can just breeze. Yeah, on. you know, uh, Norberto and Berwin, you know, they've been really solid in advocating for, uh, you know, inclusion and growth within this transport space. Not even just inclusion and growth, but respect, you know, yeah. within this space. And, you know, this is just another example. You know, those of us who are trying to abide by the law, those of us who are trying to be compliant and compliant, right, and operate, you know, efficiently as the law requires, we're cut out as a product of us trying to do right. Whereas those who have the money, the legal power to, to skirt the law, they're able to, you know, do whatever the hell they want without much uh, repercussion as a product of the state not having the capacity to enforce and regulate law, right? So, um, again, we just call for the state to really take transportation seriously and not just some, you know, letter that's written into the law, but like an actual, you know, industry that will, you know, influence the market. Like product comes to the market as a product of transport. We are the circulatory system here. And if regulation isn't upheld, what is the point of seed to sale tracking? What is the point of the law period, right? So um, again, just thank you. And I, I definitely want to just give uh, kudos to Noberto as well as Ber Berwin, as well as others who have been fighting in this space since the beginning, since before this was even a space. And, um, you know, there's a lot of advocacy here. There's a lot of work happening on the ground. And uh, I thank you, Cole, for giving me an opportunity just to put my, my voice forward. Oh, absolutely, dude. Anytime, anytime. And I actually met... Uh... Mr. Brown one one time uh just like randomly I think it was at a uh, I think it was at the cannabis town hall that I was telling you about where I asked about the delivery thing he was there and I like I like walked past him and I was like wait a minute man who why do I know you why and he was like man it's probably because I'm on TV a lot or whatever because and I was like yes that's exactly it I watch videos that have you in it so any, anyways, uh, about to play this uh, next clip here, and I'm curious if it spins up any other thoughts um, for you, because I feel like this is like it kind of the undertone of what uh, Norberto was playing, uh, saying in that clip, and uh, it's interesting to even hear it from the big operators too in, in this context. Uh, now, complaints. NBC five and Sorry, complaints about transportation. Investigates Illinois has very tight rules for how cannabis can be transported and delivered. In fact, those rules are stricter than the federal guidelines for opioids, the most abused drug in America. Here's the story from Phil Rogers. We have more to grab? Yeah. yeah. We're at a distribution center for Cresco Labs in suburban Chicago. And what these workers are loading is one of the most tightly controlled cargoes in America. The cargo is legal cannabis, at least legal in the eyes of the state of Illinois. But the rules for how it's transported are spelled out in pages of state regulations. Security is aware of every shipment that goes out, where it's heading, what time they should arrive. That security actually starts all the way back when the cannabis plants are grown. Each plant receives its own barcoded number. And those numbers follow the plants and their products through processing here at Cresco's suburban facilities, all the way through packaging, transport, and delivery to dispensaries statewide. Correct. And we refer to as seed to sale. Illinois law requires cannabis transporters to move their wares in vehicles where the products are locked tight in a separate compartment. Then there's a second set of locked doors outside. The trucks can't be marked, and at least one crew member has to stay in the vehicle at all times. What is this? This is our um, tracking software platform. Cresco's fleet is monitored in real time. Onboard cameras provide a view inside and outside the trucks, and GPS will alert the company if the truck tries to cross state lines. We know exactly where they're at at all times. But there's a bit of irony here. Remember, in the eyes of the federal government, cannabis is still illegal. But the Illinois guidelines for transporting pot are much stricter than the federal rules for moving much more dangerous drugs. It was very casual. Um, all of the product would go into my personal vehicle in a, just a standard Coleman cooler. Cresco's logistics manager, Joseph Franks, told us he used to work for a major hospital transporting everything from chemotherapy drugs to prescription painkillers. Where would it be in the car? It would be in my back seat. 
The DEA's position on moving even the most abused drugs in America, opioids like OxyContin, is that licensees are simply responsible for getting them where they are supposed to go. The federal regs say all applicants and registrants shall provide effective controls and procedures to guard against theft and diversion of controlled substances. We do have uh, millions and millions of controlled substances that are moved through the system, through the mail, through UPS, through FedEx. Former DEA agent Jack Teitelman now works as a consultant on compliance with drug regulations. If you decide that you know your your method of distribution is on the back of a bicycle and a, and a on a backpack because that fits into that neighborhood and you've never had an issue, then that might be the correct way of of making that delivery into that neighborhood. Twenty eight eleven. That is not the case with marijuana in Illinois. Illinois is the most heavily regulated state that we operate in. Heavily regulated and lucrative, with nearly $1.8 billion in sales since it was legalized in Illinois just two years ago. Phil Rogers, NBC5 Invest. So that video was a little bit older, but um, another testament to how strict the regulations are that you all have to comply with. I'm curious, what you got any thoughts based off of that clip? Yeah, you know, uh, you have state regulation, then you have industry standards. You know, when when we created our standard operating procedures, we looked at the industry standards and, you know, much of these regulations are just the standards, you know, across the industry. So we're willing to comply. Um, we did not see this as burdensome, you know, personally. Um, but wouldn't know, it be nice if you could just put it in your front seat? and just I mean, it would car. be nice, but our insurance company, they are not going for that, you know, frankly, um, mm -hmm. you know, state state aside. Our insurance company also had some major requirements, um, but of course, it would be nice. It would be nice to. Uh, to what would to OxyContin people do? Because that's like it's it's crazy because it's like the same. I don't know if it's the same scheduled drugs. Cannabis is schedule one, so it really depends on what you're moving. But he was saying that he was moving like pretty highly scheduled drugs, just throwing it in the front seat of his car. So like. And that was for a pharmaceutical company. And I know that might be a different thing because they're like licensed at a pharmaceutical level and maybe that's what it is. But I wonder like uh, what insurance they use. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm curious to see. I'm curious. But, you know, if, if we could relax the laws, I'm all for it. For us, you know, I'm I'm not too worried about just frankly, personally, what was required of our vehicle mm. compliance. I'm, you know, I'm not too worried about you know, I'm seeing some states are even looking at allowing transport with only one driver. I question that, you know, because I would mm. never want to leave a vehicle uh, unattended, like personally, just from our business model. I would always want someone with a vehicle while there's likely up to $250,000 worth of cannabis product on board. Um, but I get it. I get the pushback, you know, at the, at the uh, you know, towards the state when it comes to this. But for us... And our company is just it's just not something it's not the hill we're willing to die on, you know, about yeah. compliance. You know, I don't mind um not having the back window. I don't mind having sure. uh, you know, a, a great welder install the appropriate cages. I don't mind installing the cameras around board. You know, I don't mind using the GPS tracker or Samsara, you know, for our uh, route management, so on and so forth. For me, it just provides a, another level of security for my team. And making sure everyone's safe. Like I get it, you know. Um, I get it. I get the pushback. But do you um, think? Do you think that what that stuff is is would be cost prohibitive for certain social equity licensees? Like, yeah, um, it could. Because be. I know Norberto really? has talked about like how much money he's put into his van. It wasn't in that video, but in other videos. Yeah, it could be, but you know. There is ways to save money in doing this. You know, I, I think what's happening with a lot of these security, um, uh, what's the word, customizations happening. There's a lot of price gouging, you know, with like the installation of a security cage on board. There's companies charging like $75,000, $80,000 to install security features like a cage at your back door. You know, we were able to cut that price tremendously. You know, a family welder, you know, license who was able to do that for us. Um, you know, we have to be creative. Like, I get it. You know, this can be burdensome. It's just when it crazy to, to hear him but say. But Norberto was still able to do it. 
Right. You know, Norberto is still in compliance. It's funny that we're seeing the MSOs, you know, crying about their vehicle security compliance because that's what we looked at. We just looked at a video of multi-state operators mm -hmm. complaining about the security requirements, which are industry standards across the country. You know, yeah. so I get it. Like if you compare it to, you know, Oxy or other, I get it. I get it. But well, this the, is the, the point know, about the bicycle, right. that was pretty crazy. That you Come could... on now. Like, come on. Like, you know, I, I'm not going to put any of my staff in a position to deliver on a bicycle. Yeah. Now, <laughs> we can look at drone delivery. You know, if folks want to have the conversation about what a, what drones could look like in this space as it stands, Illinois bans, you know, kind of non-vehicle um, transport. But um, no, we're we're not. I, I'm not going to advocate for bike delivery of cannabis, <laughs> you know, personally. But again, this just isn't something that I'm willing to die on. I think the more important issues are that home delivery piece, you know, the funding piece, and then the ability to dock and store cannabis overnight. I think these are the critical um, issues that deserve, like, the that really um, keen eye from the media, right? I get it, the security compliance piece. I get it. But for us, I think the thought of it created more anxiety than actually coming into compliance. You know, once we were able to really step back and look at it, aside from those who are really price gouging, right, and think creatively about it, we were able to make it happen, you know. And of course, you know, the state could come in and find something wrong and maybe my tune would change at that point. But as it stands, you know, the security compliance is not the burden. That's not the uh, the barrier for us what do you think transportation looks like is it like a pizza delivery where like you're waiting for the guy to go back and like pick up the van and you got a guy like and and by the way and with pizza delivery sometimes they don't start delivering until 4 p.m you know to until like 9 p.m or whatever um but like do you envision it like pizza delivery or do you envision it like ice cream truck or do you you know like what what is transportation gonna look like do you the think? home delivery transport or, yeah yeah sorry home delivery yeah yeah, yeah. you know I, I think there's some incredible 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 vehicle options on the market um whether it be the uh you know the pro master city the uh mitras the uh the, the other smaller ford transit well i guess what i'm asking i guess what i'm asking is like uh like I've seen in Massachusetts, we had somebody on that actually received the first delivery in Massachusetts. And it was interesting, like somebody they, they placed the order and then somebody came and they had like a body cam on, but they gave them the bag. And like, uh, do you but it was like they called and it dispatched from the dispensary. Like, do you th do you envision it being like on you're sitting there on call at the dispensary? Or are you just like rolling around with like I'm kind of thinking like, what does this look like? Yeah, so there's a few approaches, right? So I mentioned the storage piece. I think when it comes to home delivery and creating right. a more like distribution a model would be amazing right. where we could store product at a warehouse and then um, create some digital apping where folks can order directly from us and or we create partnerships with the actual dispensaries. And let's not forget the infuser processors as well, uh, where we can take product to market. Now that's going to require some shifts and laws, but the entire erection of a home delivery uh, process and protocol will require laws to change. But I think if we can get that that overnight storage piece and create a distribution model for transporters, that would be ideal where we could warehouse products uh, and really get it to the homes from our warehouses. You know, of course, those warehouses will have to have the proper security, so on and so forth. But I think that would be like the ideal approach. But, you know, in the meantime, we're definitely willing to partner with uh, dispensaries, you know, in creating tech and creating apps where we can provide just another outlet for the de deliveries to introduce their products to a broader market. You know, that would it would imply us becoming, you know, marketing agents, agents of sorts and really informing the public about products available at a various uh, number of dispensaries. Um, but that distribution model for me is like ideal where we can would be able to warehouse product and then move from our warehouse directly to the consumer at home. Makes sense. Um, and that sounds cool as hell. Um, so sweet. Well, I feel like I covered all the bases that, that I can think of right now. Um, again, though, always an open invite.
from my you, from my end. Yeah. Um, but if I ever have anything that comes up where I'm like, I wonder what a transporter thinks about this, I'll yeah. reach out to you. Yeah, certainly. Um, and um, you know, I mentioned Norberto earlier, and I, I wanna again shout out the uh Illinois Independent Transport Canada, hold on, let me say it right. The Illinois Independent Cannabis Transporter Association and for the work that's happening at that level, um, as we continue to advocate for growth within the Illinois industry uh, with respect to transport. So thanks, Go. Absolutely. Well, folks, I hope you found as much value in this conversation as I did. Jim, I just want to thank you again for reaching out and uh, keep in touch. Looking forward to the next time we talk. And folks, we'll see you in the next episode. Take care. <laughs>